So today I'll talk about water distribution. Before I do that, though, I, I've left at least one thing behind in balloons, um, pro and prompted in part by a question that came in by text last time, but also just it's important to the problem set, which, of course, at some point you'll care about. And that's this, that, that Archimedes' principle, the idea that, that if, you dis if, you, if you're in a fluid here on the Earth with, with gravity push, pulling down the fluid, and the fluid, therefore, has a, a gradient in pressure in it, Archimedes' principle perfectly describes the buoyant force that, that an object immersed in this fluid experiences. Uh, you know, that's this awkward way of saying it all. Um, let me remind you that in the absence of gravity, you won't have, in the absence of gravity and without acceleration going on, any gas you've got is going to distribute itself uniformly in pressure. It's going to accelerate toward low pressure until there's no low pressure left. Everything's at the same pressure. So if you have a big box full of air and no gravity around and the box is not accelerating, uniform pressure. As a result, there'll be no buoyant force. So if you put a balloon or any object you like in the middle of this gas, nothing's going to happen to it in terms of a push on it by the gas, because the pressure is the same everywhere. It's going to push as, just as hard to the right as to the left, to the up, to down. It's all going to cancel out to nothing. So astronauts in, in deep space, in their spacecraft full of air, no pressure gradient. Is that, is, is that OK? When they're, when they're at constant velocity, no pressure gradient. If, they, if you put an object in the middle of the, the, this, this gas, it's going to experience no buoyant force. And if there are no other forces on it, it's, not, it's just going to just sit there. Motion, object at rest, staying at rest. Is that OK so far? Are there questions about that so far? Come back to Earth. Now we've got a pressure gradient. Aha! Because of the pressure gradient, there is a buoyant force. And here on Earth, with gravity pulling down on us, the buoyant force is upward. And the, it's as strong as what? It's exactly as strong as the fluid it displaces. So we saw that before. If I put a, a helium balloon in the middle of the air, it's pushed upward with a force equal to an air-shaped, a balloon-shaped blob of air, which is, has, it's pushed up pretty hard compared to the weight of the helium balloon. The helium balloon has a net upward force and it floats. Hopefully at, that point, at this point, you're okay with that. The question comes up, well, what happens if if you take, for example, a piece of wood and you throw it in the water, you know from long experience, the it bounces around a bit, negotiating the usual sort of thing, and then it settles down partly in the water and partly out of the water, right? What's going on there? And so this is the big thing I left behind. At, when the, when the piece of wood is at equilibrium, it is displacing a mixture of air and water, both fluids. And that particular choice of mixture is just right that, the, that it's displacing, the, the, whatever the shape of the piece of wood is, it's displacing exactly its weight worth of water and air. If it were displacing too, too much water and air and it was actually had a buoyant force stronger upward as a result than its own weight, it would, it would accelerate upward and it would, it would readjust. So, so the wood's bobbing up and down trying to figure out exactly how much Water and how much air. Don't ignore the air. The air matters. You're displacing a second fluid. And the thing bobs around until it's displacing the perfect mixture. Um, it's a stunning result, really. I, I, I'm, I'm telling it to you as though it's magic. You can figure out, it is, you can sit down and prove that it has to be like this. But the presence of the air matters. If, for example, you had the piece of wood there floating on the surface of the water and therefore um, displacing both water and air. If you took the air away by some miraculous uh, process, the wood would be displacing less fluid. It's still displacing the wood, the water, but the air's gone. So the, the weight it displaces has reduced. It's get, the buoyant force will shrink, and it will actually descend deeper into the water to summon up more buoyant force from the water. Is that okay? Um, so thing, you know, you'll see old questions on my, my exams, maybe come on a new exam one day. Uh, things like the barometric pressure changes and the air is suddenly less dense. And this happens. And when, when, the, when the air is less dense, it's on its route, en route to being not there. So you're displacing. Displacing it doesn't do you as much good. You need to float deeper in the water 
to, to summon up the buoyant force to support yourself or a piece of wood. Any questions about that, those ideas? Yes. When, when a, like a ship, so you've got a ship floating on water, and the, it's, it's displacing, assuming that it's, got a, it's closed, we'll, just, we'll close all the doors so that we, we have a well-defined ship body. If you calculate the weight of the water it's displacing plus the weight of the air it's displacing, that, that, that sum will give you a certain value of total weight. And the buoyant force on, on the, that's, that is the buoyant force upward on the ship, and it will be equal to the weight of the ship. So that you, you can weigh the ship by doing this, and they do it routinely. So that ships are often marked. Uh, the, the bow of the ship, for example, can have lines on it telling you how deep you are in the water. And, and based on how deep the ship is in the water, you can determine, ultimately, what it's containing, what, you know, what's in it. And so, so try to make this a, a clean, simple story. In the old days of sending ships to, to China to, to get tea, to, to, uh, let's see, they would pick up tea in China and they'd come back. Tea is light, fluffy stuff, so they would have to, now this, this is a too complicated story, they would get China, they would bring back pottery as well to, to, to bring the ship deeper in the water. Set that one aside, it's a good story, but it's too long, um, too messy. Back to, back to normal shipping in, in, in modern era. An empty ship floats higher in the water. Why? Because it has less weight. It needs to displace less water, more air. Light, fluffy stuff is good. If you then load the ship full of stuff, now it's heavier. It needs a bigger buoyant force to keep it afloat. So it, it digs deeper into the water, displaces less air, more water, summons up a bigger buoyant force and supports itself. And that's adequate story, probably. And they do actually look at how, how deep the, the ship is in the water to determine how loaded it is. Is that okay? All right, so I'll stop with that story. Um, any other questions about balloons and floating and buoyant forces and so on? I, I, I will point out, and it's going to show up in your problem set, um, you can get pressure gradients for reasons other than gravity. Think about if, you, if you're accelerating what happens to the air? I'll, I'll give you the story, actually. If, you're, if you have ever driven in a car with a helium balloon, you know, little kids love helium balloons. They love to bring them into the car, and you go driving along with the helium balloon. Every time you accelerate forward, what happens? Well, the car accelerates forward. The air, might, maybe not. The air wants, has inertia. It wants to sit there. So, it, so it, it tries to, but the back of the car pushes it forward, pushes the air forward by way of a pressure gradient. A pressure gradient develops in the car with high pressure at the back of the car, low pressure at the front, creating a pressure gradient that pushes the air forward. Is that okay? There's a pressure gradient, high pressure in the back, low pressure in the front. If you displace that air, you get a buoyant force forward towards the lower pressure because a balloon in, the, in this pressure gradient will experience a higher pressure at the back of the car side than at the front of the car side. So there's a forward buoyant force on, a, on an object in a car accelerating forward. I hope that's, you can follow that idea. And you can figure, I'll let you guys figure out, if you've got two balloons, one full of air, which is a normally a sinker, and one full of helium, which is normally a floater, if you take those two balloons and release them, in a car that is accelerating forward, which way will they move? And they will not move the same direction. And I could ask it as a question, but I won't ask it as a question. You understand the question? You guys think about it. If you, if you can't get an answer, come ask me. OK? All right. Water distribution. I'll go on to water distribution. Um, in this sort of, we're going to start to let water move, let fluids move. In the story of balloons, mostly things were just sitting around waiting. Balloons are just hovering or you know, barely moving. We'll start to get them moving a little bit. They'll really move come, come uh, garden watering and ultimately airplanes. So there are a couple of agendas I have here. I'm going to leave most of it in the, in the lecture video and in the book. 
but I want to make sure I, I, I cover the most important points and show you some of these, these effects. The first thing is, is that like everything else, fluids have, they have inertia, they have mass, they, they respond by accelerating when you push on them and so on. Um, but because they're fluids and have no fixed shape, the pushing is different. Uh, it involves pressure rather than forces, although they're very much related. And we can watch fluids accelerate or force, cause them to accelerate and so on. So, so I just want to give you some of the rules involved in this. Now, if I've got a straw here ho uh, oriented horizontally and, and mostly full of water, let me fill it full of water because I can. Okay. So it now actually is full of water. And because it's ho oriented horizontally, gravity is pulling down on the water, but the sides of the straw are supporting the water, and it's basically uh, gravity plays no important part in this current story. The water is an object at rest, staying at rest. And it's not experiencing any net force, and certainly not horizontally. And that's because the pressure on the left side and the right side are the same. They're, the pressures of the air are, are truly pushing on those co that, that column of water, the horizontal column of water, but they're pushing equally on each side. I can muck that up, and will, because I, right? When I, when I blow through the, through the straw, I'm putting high pressure on my side, low, there's still atmospheric pressure on the other side, and the water accelerates toward low pressure. So this is a general rule. Water given it, in the absence of gravity, water accelerates toward low pressure. With gravity, it gets a little complicated, but, but we'll do that. Okay, so, so fluids accelerate. Pressure, pressure imbalances cause a fluid to accelerate. And what else? It always accelerates towards lower pressure, because that's the direction of the net force on the portion of water overall. Should be, that should not be a big surprise. In the presence of gravity, uh, or, or if I do a vertical straw, there's, a, there's an additional force. So you've surely done this, where, where you've taken a straw. Yeah, I know they're trying to get rid of straws in the world, spoil all the fun that kids can have. But anyway, um, with a straw oriented this way, the water, if it were experiencing the same pressure at the bottom as at the top, and you know, you know it would be slightly different, but, but so small that for water this is not, it's, it will fall. If I let go of it, you know what happens, right? The water will, will pretty much fall, right? Out it goes. Let's try again. What I'm doing by, by capping the top, which seems like the wrong place to have my finger on it, by capping the top, I'm allowing the water to, to try to descend, and it does briefly, but it, it very quickly creates a, an empty spot above the column of water where the pressure is less than atmospheric. So this is back at equilibrium, and, and what's the current arrangement? Well, there's pressure at the bottom of the straw, pressure at the top, which I'll come to, and the water sitting there is experiencing a, a, its own weight. It's, pu it's pulled downward. Well, why doesn't it fall? It doesn't fall because there's not an equal pressure at the bottom as at the top. There is a pressure imbalance pushing upward. The pressure at the bottom is, is greater than the pressure at the top. Well, the pressure at the bottom is atmospheric pressure. It's this stuff. So the pressure at the top is actually less than atmospheric. And that's OK. I've, I've sealed it. There's, air can't get in there, so the pressure up there can be anything it, it wants based on the, the, what's going on there. And what was going on is the water is trying to leave and the pressure drops below atmospheric. So in the absence of, when, when gravity is not on playing a role in horizontal, the world of horizontal motion, pressure imbalances dominate everything. They cause all the accelerations. In the world of vertical orientations, now gravity is a player. The pressures have to, for things to sit in equilibrium, the pressures have to to be, vary with height. Um, in effect, we're, we're supporting, I, I won't go that way, I'll stop there. So where I want to take this then is, is the world of, of drinking straw. When, when, you, when you drink water out of a glass, this is a directly apropos of one of the problems that questions, when you drink water out of a glass, you're not attracting the water to your mouth by way of some mysterious force. What you're doing is you're lowering the pressure above the water. 
right? You, you, you draw air out of the straw, you know, take a drink, okay? It's, you're, you're removing air molecules, therefore you're dropping its density, therefore the pressure drops as well, we've seen that already. And so the pressure inside the straw goes below atmospheric pressure. And it can only do that, of course, if it's in a sealed environment so the air can't go in and replace it. So we've dropped the pressure inside the straw below atmospheric. The pressure outside the straw is greater than inside the straw. The water is pushed up, is lifted by the pressure imbalance. And that's how a straw works, okay? So the question comes up, can you, can you draw water up a straw as long as you like, you know, a, a mile? Can you, can you go to the top of a tall building with a very long straw, dip it into somebody's drink down below and, and steal their drink? And the answer is no. And the reason for that is that, again, you're not attracting the drink up to your mouth. You're lowering the pressure above the drink and allowing atmospheric pressure around the drink to push the water up the straw. And as the column of, of let's, let's let it be water, as the column of water gets taller and taller, its weight gets greater and greater, and yet it's being lifted by the difference in pressure between the pressure inside the straw, which is low, and atmospheric pressure outside the straw, which is what it is. As the column gets taller, the weight gets greater, and eventually the weight is too much for that pressure imbalance to support. The, the, the overall, if you think in terms of forces, the weight downward, which is a, a force, and the net pressure-related force upward, they, they, we need them to balance to keep the water at, at that certain height. If the column gets too high, its weight's too much, and the, the upward force due to the pressure balance is not strong enough to support it. Questions about that idea? So, drinking out of a short straw, no problem. Does someone, will someone volunteer to drink out of that straw? Please, Sam. So, so you, you get to, to go up the catwalk here. And historically, this floor used to be about three feet lower. There's a ramp that you walk up to get here. So, so you just, just climb up the catwalk, go around the curve, and you'll be on, you'll, OK? <laughs> and she's going to drink the water in this green container. The floor used to be lower, and this, this activity used to be tougher. She will succeed, but it's not easy to draw water that, that much, that, that far up. Yay, okay, there you go. All right, so, so, so the straw up there, yeah. your, your job is to draw the water out of that container by removing air from the straw so the water out, the, the atmosphere can push the water up and right. see where you can get it. You should be able to do it. It, it should work. It should be hard. It should it'd be nice if it were harder. Okay, go for it. Can, can, is, is the water visible? It's not very dark. Are you getting it? Can I see it going? And I can see, I can see it going. It's, it's, it's pretty faint. N another time, pour more. Is there more color here? No. You're, are you able to get it or, or not? Uh, I'm never getting it. Okay. So, we, you know, we should have inky, really dark, dark, or, you know, oh well. Yeah. Okay. Suc success and failure, yes. <laughs> All right, thanks. All right. Um, well, yeah. Um, the, the, point, the, point, the point being, it's, it, it is quite hard to, to draw it up this far. Evidently, you know, it's, it's, right on the, it's right on the edge. It used to be, for sure, no one was able to do it. Now, now it's right on the edge. Thank you. Um, if, if this were twice as tall, not even a machine could do it. I mean, no one could, even if you removed all the air above the column of water, you could not lift the water any higher because it's not an attraction process. It's, an, it's allowing the surrounding air pressure to push it up. And the surrounding air pressure can only push so hard and only lift it so high, even against nothing pushing back. When, when, it, re, when it maxes out, suppose you took away all the air above, uh, in, in that hose, it's, it, in that situation, 
the water will rise until it, the bat, it's a battle between the weight of the air and the entire atmosphere pulling down and the weight of the, of the water in the hose pulling down. If those, if those two, if one of them is, is, creates bigger pressure at the bottom than the other, there will be movement toward the lower pressure. And the balance occurs, and I'm saying this terribly, but the balance occurs when the weight of the water is equivalent to the weight of the entire column of air going up to the top of the, to the, top of the atmosphere. Let me, let me just try to, 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 to bring this back in. If you look over a square meter of, of ground and you look up at the atmosphere, the weight overhead is about 100,000 newtons all the way to the top of the atmosphere. If you take 10 meters of water, which is much denser, and you put it above that same one square meter of, of ground, and you look up, it's about 100,000 newtons. It's the same weight. What that means is that the pressure down here necessary to support 10 meters of water is the same as the pressure over here needed to support the entire atmosphere column. And so if you take these two, punch a hole between the two containers that have them, the water will not flow from one to the other. The pressures are equal, so they won't ex there's no acceleration. So 10 meters of water has, creates the same pressure as, ten, as the entire atmosphere. That's really where I want to go, but I, didn't, you know, I apologize for not getting it as clear as I'd like. Sometimes I just can't do it. OK, um, so, so bring the water up with a straw. You're doing it by allowing the atmosphere to lift the water up. This leads to all kinds of familiar uh, devices. The wa a water cooler, for example. In a water cooler, you've got a bottle full of water, or pretty full of water, inverted in the dispenser part of the, of the water cooler. And there's no, there's no seal here. This bottle's turned upside down. I guess I can, I guess I can uh, zoom in on it. Although this, again, requires dimming the lights. There. There's no seal. That, that, water, that water in there could go out if it wanted to. But it can't because the pressure at the top of the water cooler bottle is below atmospheric pressure. And so atmospheric pressure is pushing up harder than the uh, pressure at the top of the bottle is pushing down. And that creates a pressure imbalance that's supporting the water in there. And it will continue to support the water until I let air molecules into that volume at the top of the bottle, allow the pressure to increase there, and the water then can be pushed out briefly until, again, it's supported by, a, by a, the pressure imbalance. So, so as you let water leak in, let air leak in, I let some air molecules leak in, water descended out of the column, it again reached equilibrium with the air pressure outside. Uh, being greater than the air pressure inside, pushing up and supporting the weight of the water still in the water cooler. Is that okay? So if you ever have a water cooler like this and, it's, and it, all the water comes out of it for some reason, it's because you've got a leak in the bottle. You, you need that seal at the top to allow a low pressure to develop in there, sufficient to support the weight of the water in the water bottle. Okay? All right, so that's water. water. Water cooler, how about a siphon, another very useful device that you all should know about. And a siphon, again, uses the idea that, that pressure Yuck. All right. Pressure differences between atmosphere and And the pressures in containers can cause water to move around, accelerate. What's happening here? Ah, I let it leak. Now I got to do it again. Okay. The siphon, it, siphon allows you to, to remove water from a container that's high and transfer it to a container that's low while going up and over. And is it? Is it Functioning here, it's not functioning. I got it started again. Try again.
Okay, there it goes. Can you see, yeah, you can see it going. So the water is leaving the high container for the low container almost miraculously. It can go up and over to get there. It actually can go pretty high up, not super high, because it'll run into the same problem as the drinking straw. But the water is transferring the high container to the low container by going up to the top. The pressure here at the top is less than atmospheric, so a pressure difference between atmospheric here and less than atmospheric there is supporting the weight of the water in this, in this arm of the siphon. And as the water then descends to the second arm of the siphon, its pressure increases. And oh, some days you just don't have it. So um, how do I want to describe why this is happening? You can think of it as the water falling down the, the long arm of the siphon. And I, I'm going to reverse these before I get wet here. The, water, the weight of the water descending down the, the long arm of the siphon creates a partial vacuum at the top of the siphon that acts as the drinking straw drinker sucking water up the short arm of the siphon. That's, that's actually decent. So having, having this long arm with a lot of weight in it creates a very low pressure at the top, which is good for sucking water out of the high, high item here. Hopefully, if you can remember this and have some understanding of how it works, this will be useful for things like, like draining uh, a hot tub or something that you've got on the deck and, and you you've, are suddenly unable to, to open the, the, the bottom somehow. You can't get the water out. How do you get the water out? Well, rather than bailing it one, one cup at a time, create a siphon. Take a hose, fill it with water. It's got to be full of water so that you get the, the weight of the water falling on one side, sucks water up the other side, and, and put the, connect the, the hose from, the, from in the water in the hot tub, up and over, and then way down the hill. And, the weight of the water descending the hose down the hill will suck the water up out of the hot tub and drain it. One other application of siphons, while well, I'm waving my hands here about them, is toilets. Everybody's favorite topic, right? Toilets have a siphon in them. My, this is American to toilets do. They have the water at the bottom of the, of the main bowl that, that, that connects up and over and down the drain. And you, in some toilets, you actually can see the siphon going up and over. And when you flush the toilet and, and fill the bowl with water, the water begins to flow up and over that, 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 the, the rise of the, of the siphon and then begin to descend. And the weight of that descending water creates a partial vacuum in the, in the arc that goes over. The partial vacuum then sucks the water out of the bowl and drains it. And this is you know, it's very familiar. You flush a toilet, and, and it fills, and then suddenly the whole thing gets sucked dry. That's the siphon kicking in and, and, and creating this, this rapid flow as the pressure, the pressure at the top of the siphon drops because of the weight of the descending water. Hopefully that's familiar. You know, take a look at it. You, you can often see that siphon. Does the siphon work because of the cohesion of the water molecules? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't need the cohesion of the water molecules. It needs the, the fact that you've got the water descending. Um, yeah, you think, you'd think that it have to have them, that the water would have to be glued together. Um, it, the water naturally creates a, a drop in, a, well, a rise in pressure as you go down, so, so it's a drop in pressure as you go up in this column of water. You get the low pressure. Um, you don't, water, don't have, water molecules don't have to stick to one another for that to work. Um, not going to be able to give you a good ex explanation again today. All right. So this is water moving around because of pressure differences. Let me show you one other thing that's important and related to this. And, and it it's, shares the same physics, finally. But, and that is that water seeks its level. You, you've seen this ha your whole life. It's an expression, water seeking its level really just means that if you put water in, in any kind of container, the water will flow until the top surface is uniform at the same altitude. And that's simply a, a result of, of stuff accelerating so as to reduce its total potential energy as quickly as possible. 
In other, specifically in this case, suppose you, you fill a bathtub and for some reason one side of the bathtub is three inches taller than the water than the other. Well, that has excess potential energy. Why? Because in effect you've taken water out of the low side and stacked it on the high side so that it's, it's too high. The average height of the water is, is higher than necessary. The water can reduce its total potential energy by descending. So the water leaves the high side and flows into the low side. And it will do that until it, it cannot get rid of any more potential energy. It can't go any lower on average. And you just for fun, you can see this happening with what are called Pascal's vases here. These, yeah, it's also, these five funny shaped pieces of glass are all connected at the bottom. So if I put water in one, it can flow into the other and to anyone it wants. And what will happen is if I fill any one of these five va vases, the water will flow into the others in order to reduce its total potential energy as quickly as possible. And it will flow until the heights of the water in each of the vases is exactly the same. And so that's it's, it seeking its level. It's all trying to balance out. And I, of course, I put that right where you can block it. Okay, so wherever I put it, it will flow until that happens. All right. Another principle worth, worth pointing out is the idea that if you, if you trap one of these, a fluid like this, and this, this kind of fluid, water, is known as an incompressible fluid, meaning, and I think I've said this before in class, but meaning that, that you can't change its volume by squishing it. A little tiny bit, but barely. A liter bottle of water is going to be a liter even if you step on it. So if you take an incompressible fluid and you pressurize one part of it by pushing on that part, and with a surface and, and trying to pack the molecules more tightly, the pressure will go up, uh, trying to fight your, your, your inward push and avoid com compression. But what, what uh, a principle known as Pascal's, is that, uh, Pascal's principle, is that right? Pascal's principle that's, uh, is that the pressure will rise throughout the entire fluid and against every surface. So, so you can pressurize an entire container of water, your, your, your water bottle, by pressurizing any part of it. The pressure is, is, is very, very quickly, uh, not dispersed, but rather spread out across the entire thing. And that has useful consequences. For example, if you push on a very small part of, of a bottle, you can push very hard on a very small part of a, of a, of a plastic bottle, for example, you can by exerting a, a large force on a small area, you could force the fluid to push back and balance you by pushing very hard on that same small area. Well, for a fluid to push hard on a small area, it has to develop a very high pressure because pressures exert force, you know, force per, square, per, per, per surface area. If the surface area involved is very small, they need a lot of pressure to crank up that force, to, to exert a large force on it. So you get systems, all the hydraulic systems in the world are based on, on Pascal's principle. The idea that if you can, by some means, pressurize the fluid in a trapped container to very high pressure, something that you can do with a very small surface and a gentle force, uh, you can create enormous forces on large surface areas. Yeah, it's also not said very well. This is just a hydraulic jack. And the, what the hydraulic jack allows me to do is with a handle, I can push very hard on a very small uh, portion of fluid so that I'll, I'll exert a large, a significant force. I've got a lever here to work with. I'll exert a significant force on a small patch of fluid. The fluid will push back on, on, on me. And if I push with 100 newtons of force, it has to push back with 100 newtons of force when everything settles into equilibrium. Well, to, for a small portion of fluid, tiny spot, to exert a force of a, a hundred newtons, it's going to have to develop a huge pressure to do this because it's only pushing on a little surface. So it needs a lot of 
pressure, a lot of force per unit of surface to push back hard enough. And I wanted the can. So I'm going to pressurize the fluid to way above atmospheric pressure. With just this little handle, I can, I can cause the pressure to rise to 100 times atmospheric pressure or more. Um, is this showing over there? I mean, you guys can see it. It's, I'll, I'll just keep the filming going on here, even if it's kind of washed out. And there's a second, so, so I'm, I'm squeezing a small, a small cylinder of, of fluid. A large cylinder of fluid is lifting the jack part of this device. And because that enormous pressure that I'm going to create here is pushing on a large surface area in this cylinder, it will produce a tremendous upward force. That's, a, that's this whole hydraulic concept. How do, how do they lift, lift your car at the service station and stuff like that? They use a hydraulic connection between a, basically a small piston and cylinder where the small piston shoved into the cylinder makes the pressure rise enormously even though you don't push very hard on it. In consequence, the big cylinder and piston, the big piston comes out because you've got trapped volume. If, you, if, you're, if, you're, if you're squeezing the fluid in this way, it's got to come out that way. So it comes out and it lifts that big cylinder with a tremendous upward force. Big pressure on a big surface it creates huge forces. So, so you, can, you can smash a can, no problem. Actually, one of the classic things they have that, that actually uses exactly this principle is when you go get an oil change for your car, there's an oil filter in there. What do you do with this, this can, this big can of oil filters? They, they get thousands of them in a, in a week. Well, they smash them with, with a device just like this. So they take the oil filter and they crush it down into a little uh, wafer. All the rest of the oil comes out. This is, now I'm releasing the, the fluid to go back to where it started from. So, you know, you want a pound of coffee? Yeah. All right. 12 minutes left, fun and games here. OK. <laughs> someday, some days. All right. I've shown you, I hope, fluids accelerate towards low pressure. The presence of gravity makes life complicated. Supports, you, know, you, can, you can use uh, pressure differences to support weight and so on. I want to let the water move now. And I'll let, so, so I'm going I'm to start moving the water. I, if I zoom back out, I have. All right. So to let the water move, I got the container I want. Uh, to, to watch water moving through a system that's just arbitrary complexity of moving, moving equipment, uh, moving water, water starting and stopping, it gets way too complicated. So we're going to look initially at very, Oh, okay. Um, I'll let move, water move in the simplest way that, that basically people know how to describe. And what that, what that way is, is to have water flow through a stationary environment and to flow continuously and uniformly through a stationary environment. So nothing's starting or stopping. The environment isn't moving. Having the water, so this is like plumbing in, in a house. The plumbing in a house, by and large, doesn't move. And that makes life simple. If the plumbing could move, it could do work on the water, and that would complicate things. So let's let the plumbing in the water in the house be, be, be motionless. And let's let the water flow through that plumbing steadily so that things aren't starting and stopping. And when that happens, you get a, phenom a, 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 a situation that's described as steady state flow. And in the world of steady state flow is, is particularly simple, and the, the physics of, of water of, of distributing water becomes especially clear and easy to, to, hopefully easy to follow. The idea is that water will flow through the system and its energy can't change. Uh, we'll see, we'll see I got, I've got to pin that down a little more carefully, but the water flowing through a system that is in steady state flow has a very steady energy. Uh, it's steady in a particular place. If you watch the water flowing through a system, so, so visualize, this is, this is going to be a system, guys. I'm going to put water in here, and it's going to be, there's going to be a little starting business going on here. But, but very soon, we're going to have water moving steadily from down the barrel 
into the hose, through the hose, up, down the hose, up the hose, through a little nozzle here, and then over into the sink. And for all practical purposes, nothing's going to be moving. No, none of the plumbing will be moving, and the water will be flowing steadily. It'll be steady state flow. Okay? In steady state flow, you can follow streamlines. And what a streamline is, is a path that, that a drop of ink that you put into the water will follow as it goes whizzing through the whole system. And if you follow along that streamline, and subsequent drops of ink will follow the same path. It's, it, it maps out the, the exact specific path that any water droplet that ever passes through this spot will go for the rest of the trip. And because nothing is changing with time, it's, it's steady, the drops will keep following the same path. And the, the observation, which is called Bernoulli's equation, and so it's, got, it's fairly famous, of course, the observation is that the energy per drop, which is to say energy per volume, along that streamline never changes, the total energy. And, and it, I, I should say this omits thermal energy. So it's, it's what's known as ordered energy, the energy that can do work. The energy that can do work of every drop along that streamline is constant. That doesn't mean that the energy can't change forms, and it often does, but the total is constant. And the total can take one of three, uh, includes three uh, forms of energy that matter. Kinetic energy, you know, the energy of motion. Gravitational potential energy, the energy associated with being high and stored in the force of gravity. And the third is pressure potential energy, the energy associated with pressure. Uh, what I didn't show you, and I'll leave for right now, is that, that pumping water takes energy. If you've ever done it, you know it's tiring. It's tiring not because of some inefficiency or friction. It's tiring because the act of pressurizing the water and delivering it takes work. And the energy passes along with the water as pressure potential energy. OK, so the main, the, the, where I want to put this, take this is that the, if you follow water along a streamline in a steady state flow system, its total energy doesn't change. But the form of the energy can. And so let me get this water started, having talked it to death. I'm going to fill this guy. I should start here. With, I'll, I'll, I'll fill this guy up, but not give it any overall energy. So I'm just putting the, putting the water in. I'm about to give it the energy it needs to get started. I'll, I'll cap this just because I can. I'm going to do the energy by, by doing work. I'm going to push it upward and lift it upward, right? I did work on it. I hope that's very familiar at this point. And so now. The energy is available. When I take my finger off the nozzle here, there will be a brief period when it's not steady state flow because things are changing. But after one second, maybe two seconds, it'll be steady state flow. And I can describe, of course, it overshoots. Yeah. The energy is going from gravitational potential energy here. It's going to pressure potential energy as it descends through the pipe. The pressure's building, the height's decreasing. It's now going back, to the, it's at the bottom, it's now going back from pressure potential energy to a little bit of gravitational, and now as it goes through the nozzle, the energy is going from pressure potential energy to kinetic energy, to gravitational, back to kinetic. It, it's a whole series of transformations, but the overall energy never changed. And actually, can I twist this guy? Yes. I'm going to bring this over more horizontal. It's a, a big cleanup day, big deal. OK. What I want to do is I want to I will have to continue uh, in talking about why the transformations are happening. I hope you can see they're happening. That there, it's now packed full of gravitational potential energy here. As it descends, there's a pressure gradient that builds up. High pressure at the bottom, low pressure at the top. That's just the natural way of things when you have the weight of the water causes an increase in pressure as you go deeper into it. So the gravitational potential energy is going to become pressure potential energy. It's going to become, return somewhat to gravitational as it rises back up. And there's a little bit of kinetic energy in the hose, but not much. And then it's going to be mostly pressure potential energy here. This is going to be pressurized water by virtue of having the water descended. And it's going to go from pressure to kinetic. There it is, kinetic. And it's back to, to gravitational. Oh, that's not steady state flow. 
in steady state flow, it's come back to where it started, right? It starts here, it goes down, it can't go any higher than this because it doesn't have the energy per drop to go higher. That spurt for a moment was a transfer of energy from, from a certain portion of the water to another portion of the water. That's impossible in steady state flow. It's not impossible if you uh, get started. Am I going to get tripped? Yeah. If I come out of this green, I come out of it green. So a point is you can't get the water to start in a container up here. You know, those of you who work on the problem set should listen. Um, you can't get the water that starts in a container up here to convert its gravitational potential energy into, into pressure and then back into other things. And it, it won't go higher than it started because it doesn't have the energy per, per portion, per, per drop, to go higher. If you want the water to go higher than it started, you're going to have to add energy to it or start with higher energy water. And higher energy water is up here. Al was putting it up there. It's up there. All right. Where's the water now? It's up there. Where'd the energy come from? Al carried it up the staircase. So it's going to descend, convert its gravitational to pressure potential energy here, and it's going to be higher pressure than, than we've dealt with up to this point. Is this, I don't, and it's going to come out here. It's going to be high pressure water here, so it have a lot of pressure potential energy. It goes through a nozzle, and nozzles, what they do for a living is they convert pressure potential energy into kinetic energy. You've seen this your whole life. I'll talk next time about why a nozzle does that. But the water should be descending. There we go. Yes. And, and, and the point is, it can go almost back where it started from, but it certainly can't go higher. All right. I'll stop. Did I, get, I didn't get you guys, did I? No. All right. With that, then, let's call it a day, and we'll continue on Wednesday.